This is an overview of the Mark III inertial electrostatic confinement uh, fusion system that I've designed. I first built this when I was an uh, undergrad at uh, Georgia Tech and subsequently upgraded it uh, when I was in grad school at University of Wisconsin-Madison and then have upgraded it since, now that I'm a postdoc at MIT. So it's come a long way. It was first built in around started building this in around 2006 and has been through a, a number of upgrades pretty much the only things that are the on the system that are the same as when it was first built are the vacuum chamber um, and the aluminum frame and the neutron detector tube as well so First giving it a walk around. So, the vacuum system is a uh, KNF, uh, starts with a KNF four stage diaphragm pump, which can pump down to around 500 millitor. Diaphragm pump backs a Pfeiffer uh, TPD 011 molecular drag pump, which is then coupled by a flex hose to a um, Pfeiffer EVI 005M valve, so electric solenoid valve, which can isolate the vacuum vessel from the pumping system when it's not in use. This is coupled into a, a Kimball Physics 8-way uh, hexagonal adapter, which has two 2 and 3 quarter inch conflat flanges and six 1.33 inch conflat flanges. Everything on this vacuum um, input manifold is then isolated from the main vacuum vessel with, with a ceramic brake. The ceramic brake also has some uh, lead foil wrapped around it for x-ray shielding and a magnetic deflector assembly uh, which puts a, a field across the, uh, the insulator to deflect any electron beams because there's also a viewport at the very top for an infrared camera so that will prevent any damage uh, from electron bombardment to that uh, germanium window. The vacuum vessel is a 6 inch diameter sphere mounted on two rotatable 8 inch diameter conflat flanges. It has two on axis ports, one on the top for the vacuum connection and one on the bottom for the high voltage grid connection and then another 8 ports mounted at 45 degree angles to the axis Four of these ports contain anode layer ion sources, which function as ion guns. And the other four ports are reserved for instrumentation. This port is capped. This port has a Faraday cup. The bottom port here has a borosilicate glass view port without any x-ray shielding. So this one has a uh, lead cap. And the top view port has a lead glass shielded uh, window. All four of these, these off-axis nipples that don't contain the ion guns also have magnetic deflector assemblies on them. This is particularly important for these off-axis uh, ports because they're, the central grid is a three-ring grid. Looking in there. And these ports as well as ion gun ports are lined with the open apertures of the grid so there is uh, streaming electrons and ions coming out through those openings and in the absence of these deflector magnets the electron and ion beam bombardment does tend to slowly etch the glass or if you're using more exotic material like a zinc selenide or germanium viewport for thermal imaging the anti-reflection coating on those is pretty easily damaged. 
The grid system is in the bottom. This is a liquid cooled grid assembly. So it has two cooling lines which carry Fluorinert FC40 coolant that's manufactured by 3M. There is a ceramic dielectric brake between the cooling lines and the high voltage section of the grid. On the other side of the grid there is a specially modified swage lock adapter which seals to a three quarter of an inch outer diameter quartz tube and has two openings for the grid tubing. So that three ring grid is made out of a single length of 16th inch outer, outer diameter um, high pressure liquid chromatography tube. The coolant flows up one. There are actually two grid lines coming out the bottom. The coolant flows up one through the grid, uh, through all three rings in the grid, then down the other, and then back out another ceramic dielectric brake. The input and output cooling lines are connected to a cooling system. The cooling system consists of an IDEX a micro pump. This is a, a magnetically coupled gear drive pump. The coolant comes out of the output. There's a pressure gauge to monitor output pressure. It then goes through a swage lock filter and out to the grid. Cooling returning from the grid goes through a thermoelectric cooling assembly. This is a water cooling uh, PC integrated pump and heat sink assembly. So there's a copper block through which the floor inert flows, then the thermoelectric cooler, then the PC heat sink assembly. So this is pumping water over the other side of that thermoelectric cooler. And that water flow is pumped up through a radiator and fan assembly and that extracts the heat from that's deposited on the grid. This uh, arrangement allows you to minimize the amount of floor inert that's used in the system because it is uh, fairly expensive. Uh, after the floor inert cooling coolant comes out of the cooler assembly, it goes into a reservoir. Grid is, connect is powered by two high voltage power supplies in parallel. These high voltage supplies are uh, Spellman uh, PTV series power supplies. These are PTV 40N200 supplies. They, however, have been modified to upgrade them into the 40N350 su supply, which just allows it to output more current. So the, um, so the uh, N200 supply would be a 200 watt supply, which could provide up to five milliamps at negative 40 kV. The N350 supply can go up to 8.8 .8 milliamps. So both of these two supplies are connected in parallel. So that gives it like a little over uh, 17 milliamps maximum current at negative 40 kV. Both supplies are controlled by a control box up top. This just programs the analog current and voltage program lines. These are analog programming supplies. The supplies are connected in parallel. They do not natively support parallel operation, but you can parallel two of the PTV supplies by connecting both voltage program lines in parallel and then connecting the current monitor line to the current program line of another. So that's what this little Y adapter does. And if you then measure the, the current off the two supplies, it does share the current evenly. So that paralleling uh, setup does work. Uh, the fuel is supplied from a tank of deuterium. This is uh, ultra-high purity deuterium from Matheson. The tank, it's a uh, lecture bottle with a CGA uh, 170 connector. The lecture bottle, I believe, is at 1800 PSI, so this is high purity deuterium gas. There's a CGA uh, 170 to 180 adapter, then a single stage regulator. This drops the deuterium pressure down to typically in, in the 20 to 50 PSI range. After coming out of the regulator, 
it's connected to a piezoelectric uh, controlled valve. This is a high speed valve with around one millisecond response time. And the output of this valve is connected into that distribution manifold. And these are all uh, coupled together with swage lock VCR fittings with copper O-rings. And then there's a further isolation valve if you need to disconnect the fuel lines for servicing. Now the pressure inside the reactor assembly is, mon is monitored with um, a MKS 901P load lock transducer. This is a combination of a micro Pirani and a, I believe it, it's a, a piezo resistive uh, transducer for so this will monitor differential pressure all the way up to atmospheric pressure. So the output of this gauge, there's both an analog and a digital output. The digital output of the gauge goes to um, an Edgar um, um, Ethernet converter. The, this takes in uh, RS-485 and connects to an Ethernet server which is monitored in MATLAB. This is actually running two gauges. There's a second MKS 901P gauge in here which monitors the, back, the uh, roughing pressure from the diaphragm pump. The analog control line, output line from the vacuum gauge, goes to a PID control system. The PID control system just monitors a uh, potentiometer a set point and compares that to the analog pressure reading.